truth. It could be truth. Wow. Yeah. But he is about to come. He's here today, and he knows it's okay. But yeah, he's here. He, I know he was in the goal. Uh, but we should get going. Yeah, from your problem. Okay. All right. All right, we'll get started. Um, I'm Jeff Key. i one of the NOAA people in the building downstairs. Uh, Kyle's advisor, academic advisor, is Tristan Lequier, but he's not here, but he'll probably show up in a minute. Uh, myself and Yingwei Lu, raise your hand, he's another NOAA guy, uh, we have been supporting Kyle on this topic, which I noticed, by the way, thank you, Kyle, for, the, for recognizing SIMS, but you probably should also say atmospheric and oceanic sciences. <laughs> anyway, uh, this is a fascinating topic, but one thing that I will say, especially for students here, uh, we started supporting Kyle on not this topic, actually we were, he was going to pursue something else um, a year and a half ago, plus or minus, and uh, you know, things don't always work out, and it wasn't Kyle's fault. We, we initially were pursuing something that was a very complex topic, both in terms of sea ice dynamics, but also uh, atmospheric forcing had to do with leads, uh, more pseudo-linear fractures in the sea ice and their relationship to uh, cyclonic forcing. And it also a great topic, but after six months or so, it just wasn't working. It was, it was too complicated. So uh, I think it was Yin Wei, actually, that suggested the topic you're going to hear about which is tractable and, and actually has great uh, potential uh, for future work. In fact, Kyle, maybe I'm jumping the gun here, but I think Kyle is either has accepted or will soon accept a fellowship with the Department of Defense uh, to pursue a PhD. And he can't tell you the topic because if he told you, <laughs> you know. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I'll let Kyle take it from here. The NDSEC Fellowship? The NDSEC Fellowship, yes. Congratulations. <coughs> um, I did accept that fellowship. Uh, but uh, can this thing work a little bit? All right. Is that? Is that on? Did you turn it on in back or did anybody turn it on? Yes. There's no, nothing in back. It's all up front. It's a blinking red light. That means the batteries are dead. That's going to mean bad things for the Department of Defense. <laughs> <laughs> That's why it's Sometimes it doesn't show as bad. Introduction, Jeff. Um, I'm happy to be here today and be able to talk to you a little bit about the work I've been doing um, for my master's over the past uh, year and a half. As Jeff said, I kind of had the topic change a little bit uh, into my master's, but um, things have come together so far, and I'm excited to uh, tell you a little bit more about it. Um, in my presentation titled "Environmental Conditions Impacting Late Summer Sea Ice Concentration Predictability in the Northwest Passage." So content-wise, I'm going to be going through an introduction where I introduce the Northwest Passage, uh, a little bit of background. Um, talk about the importance and change that the Arctic uh, environment has been experiencing that impacts the Northwest Passage. Um, I'll introduce my research goal and my uh, guiding questions before going to my <laughs> sets and methods. Um, then for my results, I'll be comparing the years of 2013 versus 2016 uh, in terms of their August sea ice concentrations, which were uh, very different. Um, I'll also be locating different years of anomalous sea ice concentrations um, uh, by uh, looking at different standard deviations of August, average August CS concentration. Um, before going into the main part of my analysis, which involves uh, three parts, uh, part one, composite analysis, part two, correlation analysis, and then part three would be a machine learning um, kind of convolutional neural network that produce, uh, predicts August CS concentration anomalies based on early season anomalies. Uh, and then after that, I'll go into my conclusions. So uh, what is Northwest Passage? Um, I use the abbreviation NWP here. It is not numerical weather prediction. <laughs> um, I know some of us are used to that, but for the next hour, Northwest Passage. Um, 
And so it's a conglomerate of sea routes that runs through the Canadian archipelago. Um, it connects Beaufort Sea in the west, Baffin Bay in the east. Um, I, kind of, I drew a diagram, um, a rough schematic of the Northwest Passage and the maritime routes uh, that are most commonly used through it. Um, the red being the most direct path and um, probably the widest path, uh, and then the black uh, routes are the subroutes that uh, are actually more commonly used, specifically this uh, southern route, uh, which sees less sea ice on average um, in the summer. So as of the end of 2022, there were only 352 complete maritime traversals of the Northwest Passage, and that includes traversals by uh, ships uh, in the late 1800s that were made of wood and they have to actually had to winter over on the sea ice all the way up to present day where uh, with nuclear icebreakers. Um, that number also includes multiple transits by single ships. Um, and 352 might seem like a lot of uh, transits in the Northwest Passage, uh, but compare that to something like the Panama Canal, which sees upwards of 15,000 ships pass through, I believe is the number, each year. Uh, you start to really get the idea that the Northwest Passage is not utilized uh, very frequently at all, and the main reason for that is sea ice. Uh, but if there's one change that we're seeing in the Arctic, it is sea ice loss uh, due to rising temperatures. Um, so the loss of sea ice is really driving the possibility of increased uh, maritime usage of the Northwest Passage. So what changes are we exactly seeing in the Arctic um, related to sea ice? Um, late summer sea ice extent in the Arctic is actually decreasing at a rate of about 13% per decade from 1979 uh, to 2020. We also are seeing amounts of multi-year ice, which is ice that survives uh, more than one season, often two years uh, or more. Um, multi-year ice is actually decreasing. This ice is generally thicker, uh, longer lasting. Um, and most of the ice in the Northwest Passage is actually first year ice, which is ice that forms and melts uh, usually within uh, one year. Uh, and landfast ice, which is ice that is fastened to um, uh, geography, uh, generally on shorelines. Um, but uh, that doesn't necessarily move around passage as much, so I'm mainly concerned about first year ice in the, the Northwest Passage. Uh, the Arctic thaw season has also expanded by about five days per decade from 1979 to 2013. Uh, by this point, the thaw season has probably changed or expanded by about 20 days, uh, which is uh, doesn't seem maybe doesn't seem like a lot uh, on a per decade basis, but the, uh, the cumulative effect of that is uh, huge and has massive implications. So, what does this all mean for the future of Northwest Passage? So, assuming the current trends in CIs continue to accelerate, Northwest Passage is likely to see an increased uh, maritime usage for um, commercial purposes as well as tourism. Uh, one example of this is the Crystal Serenity, which I have an image of right here, um, which actually traversed the Northwest Passage with over 1,000 passengers in the years 2016 and 2017. Um, the ship has minimal ice strengthening. It can go through first year ice and such, um, but as far as like a polar class six vessel, which is the equivalent of an icebreaker, that's not what North, uh, the Crystal Serenity is. Um, so they had to be pretty confident that they're not going to encounter um, high sea ice concentrations of uh, thick ice. Um, but as you'll see later, um, they didn't have to worry about that too much in 2016. Um, so trade activity may offer shorter routes uh, utilizing the Northwest Passage um, in, uh, compared to traditionally used routes uh, like the Panama Canal, for instance, in Japan to the East Coast of the United States, uh, specifically the Northeast of the United States. It's actually quicker to use the Northwest Passage than it is to go through the Panama, Panama Canal. Um, which can uh, save time and money, but also reduce fossil fuel use uh, uh, on a per trip basis. Um, however, uh, you know, in order to use the Northwest Passage uh, in these capacities, uh, CS concentration prediction has to improve because you don't want to have accidents in the Northwest Passage that could lead to oil spills and ecosystem damage and uh, you know, uh, destroy culturally significant areas because the Canadian archipelago is uh, home to many native communities as well. Um, you could have loss of human life in these accidents, and it's also important for uh, rescue purposes. If the ship loses uh, power or mechanical failure, um, there has to be a rescue vessel that has to be able to get to them, uh, and they need to know where the sea ice is uh, in order to do that. So everyone's favorite topic, geopolitics. Um, Canada has the strongest claim to the waters. Um, it is through the Canadian archipelago, um, but many argue uh, some major areas of the passage, not necessarily Canadian territory, um, I don't know, Laws, uh, maritime law of what is and what isn't, but um, the first commercial vessel actually to traverse the Northwest Passage was the, uh, the SS Manhattan in 1969, which was a U.S. oil tanker. Uh, there's an image of it on the right. Um, and it did so without Canadian permission, uh, but the Canadians actually ended up providing icebreaker assistance anyway, uh, probably because they thought it's better to just give the icebreaker assistance rather than have an oil tanker uh, run aground or crash into sea ice and you know, have oil spill in Arctic. Um, I imagine in the background there were some angry phone calls between the uh, leaderships of two nations. Um, 
but to this day, the U.S. and Canada agree to disagree on ownership, uh, and uh, probably will become a major topic uh, moving forward. Um, as, uh, you know, as the Northwest Passage starts to see less and less CX. So this is an example of open versus closed uh, Northwest Passage. On the left is an image from August 2013 from Modis, and the right is an image from Beers in August 2016. Uh, you can see in 2013 there's a lot of CX. Um, that's crowding the central uh, central area of the uh, Canadian archipelago, which would make it really difficult for a non-ice strengthened ship or non-icebreaker to really make it through that area um, without making strong or large deviations to the routes, increasing time and such. Uh, but in 2016, uh, you see that, that actually changed quite a bit. Uh, there's still some sea ice, but I mean, theoretically, you could have a vessel not even strengthened for ice and weave your way through the sea ice and get to the other side of the Northwest Passage. And uh, the main part of my work is we looking at okay, what was the difference between uh, these two years and how does that change uh, through other years with novel CS conditions. So previous, uh, looking at uh, previous research that uh, relates to Arctic shipping, uh, Wang et al. in 2022 uh, talked about the decreased risk for shipping through the Arctic uh, due to thinning the sea ice, uh, and they talked about how the southern route of the Northwest Passage is probably the least risky in terms of sea ice um, in this image. Uh, the southern routes are the ones that are made clear, the northern route still has a decent amount of ice in the summers. Um, but they argued that 2050 would be the year in which the benefit would outweigh the risk of using this snow river route uh, for shipping through the Northwest Passage. And uh, I think there, there's a lot of model agreement too that agrees on that. Uh, in the summer, in 2050 is going to be largely ice free in the northern route as well. Um, you and all 2020 talked about the Northeast Passage, which is on the Russian side of the Arctic, which are seeing similar changes, diminished sea ice, less risk for shipping, um, air temperature driving the uh, sea ice melt as well as low level winds which impact uh, sea ice and then it transports sea ice, so, uh, which is an important aspect of navigability um, through maritime vessels. Um, and I'll be talking plenty about low level winds in a little bit. Um, Capture et al. Uh, talked about spring atmospheric processes impacting sea ice melt. Uh, they also made a simple statistical model, not a machine learning model, um, to predict some September sea ice concentrations and found a uh, significant correlation with about 0 0.5. So that leads me to my goal, my research, uh, which is to better characterize environmental variables that impact late summer sea ice concentration in the Northwest Passage, to test a convolutional neural network, trained on anomalies to predict sea ice concentrations uh, in that region. Uh, my guiding question is just split that goal into two, essentially, uh, which variables impact late summer sea ice concentration and when do they become important, as well as can a machine learning approach based on these variables accurately predict late summer sea ice concentration anomalies. The data sets I'm going to be using to do this are uh, data set for a lot of us are familiar with uh, ERA 5, at, uh, which is quarter three horizontal resolution daily average from 1982 through 2020. Uh, specifically, I'm going to be using the two meter temperature, uh, zonal uh, winds, and the meridional winds at 10 meters. And then I'm going to be using a CS concentration passive microwave product from NOAA uh, via the NSIDC um, at 12 and a half kilometer horizontal resolution from the years 1982 through CA thickness will become from the advanced very high resolution radiometer polar pathfinder extended product at 25 kilometer resolution from 1982 to 2020 uh, at daily uh, observations. So for those of you who may have caught that, I'm using passive microwave during belt season. Uh, not the best, you have surface emissivity changes uh, in this case, which may affect uh, uh, CS concentration retrievals. Uh, oftentimes there's a negative bias in products. Uh, but this specific product I'm using has, uh, I've been using it for two reasons. One is the, the historical, uh, it, it really covers back to 1979, a little bit before, I'm using 1982 onwards, but it, it's the only product that really goes that far back in time to present day. Um, it also uses two algorithms to calculate CS concentrations, um, the bootstrap algorithm and the NASA Teams algorithm. And from these two algorithms, um, the value, it calculates the CS concentration at each pixel, and the value it keeps is actually the higher value uh, to combat this bias. And I've noticed it performs very well, specifically in the region of my interest, the Northwest Passage. Um, there are other regions of the Arctic where this product might not be as reliable. Um, but for my purposes, it's uh, doing rather well. So methods. Um, all of my data is literally interpolated to fit a 12 and a half kilometer horizontal resolution. So part one is going to involve pause analysis. Where I'm going to Compare net anomalies between two different samples. I'll explain later what net anomalies exactly are. Uh, but the two samples are going to be years with August CS concentration at least one standard deviation higher than normal, and then the other sample will be uh, August CS concentration uh, one standard deviation less than normal. 
Uh, part two, I'm going to be looking at correlations. Um, I'm going to correlate the net anomalies over three month periods uh, to the August CS concentration anomaly to test these for the significance. The reason I'm doing this is to test the usefulness of various variables as environmental predictors of August CS concentration anomalies. And part three, uh, the machine learning prediction. So using a convolutional neural network or CNN to predict CS concentration anomalies in the Northwest Passage and then compare these results to the actual values from the passive microwave data set. So, back to this image. What was different in 2013 versus 2016? Because there's going to be a difference. If there's this much ice uh, in the central Canadian archipelago, 2013 versus 2016, there's got to be a difference uh, between the environmental conditions. So, calculating freezing three days in 2013 versus 2016. For June, July, and August, uh, for 2013 on top and 2016 on bottom, I calculated what are called freezing degree days. Freezing degree days are the difference uh, on a daily scale of the freezing temperature of seawater above negative minus one degree Celsius uh, subtracted by uh, the daily average environmental temperature. So the larger freezing degree day value uh, would signify colder temperatures. Um, the lower freezing degree day value would actually signify warmer temperatures. And this box region right here uh, on the on figures uh, covers the Canadian archipelago. You can see in 2013, we had positive freezing degree day values, colder conditions, uh, which would be more conducive to sea ice being present um, and the Northwest Passage system being closed. Um, in the 2016, you kind of see the opposite trend. Uh, there's negative freezing degree, bill, freezing degree day values, warmer conditions, less conducive to sea ice, more melting. Now, uh, anomalous winds are also uh, a I calculate the anomalous winds at 1,000 hectopascals in June, July, and August again in 2013 on this top row, in 2016 the bottom row. You kind of see, a, a, I, I put an arrow to show the general uh, pattern with the blowing. It's a little bit hard to see the vectors. Um, but in 2013, you actually have winds blowing into the Northwest Passage, uh, transporting sea ice, which would raise sea ice concentrations. In 2016, winds are actually blowing out of Northwest Passage or in a way where this ice would not enter, which keeps uh, CS concentration lower uh, or the same. So we see that there's a difference between these two particular years, but what about other years? Um, so what I do here is for each year in my data sets, uh, 1982 through 2020, uh, so 39 different years, I calculate uh, the monthly average CS concentration detrended uh, for January through December, and I just plot it. But then what I also plotted is the plus and minus uh, one standard deviation of average August CS concentration. What you end up with uh, are these years uh, that are in red are the high August CS concentration, so uh, positive anomaly CS concentration years, uh, and green would be the negative anomaly or negative CS concentration anomaly years. We end up in six years in both samples. 1992, 2001, 2013, 2014, 2018, and 2020 would be above average CS concentrations in August, and anomalously low years would be 1998, 2007, 2008, 2011, 2012, and 2016. Um, this, for reference, is the region I calculated the August CS concentrations over, not including land because there's no CS concentration. There's no CS over land. Um, so it brings me into part one about the positive analysis. Um, I calculate what are called net anomalies which is the sum of the daily anomalies um, over a certain period of time. In my case, I chose three month periods, so there'll be six different three month periods I'll show you in the figures uh, coming up. And why, why am I using uh, net anomalies? Um, they show the balance of the environmental variables over a period of time. Um, wind, temperature, they tend to work on different time scales in terms of uh, how they affect sea ice. So, uh, um, but adding up the anomalous, uh, their anomalous effect over this uh, time frame will give the net effect each has. Specifically, I use 10 meter UNV winds, 2 meter temperature, sea ice concentration, sea ice thickness, um, net anomalies over three month periods at each pixel, uh, and I average them over the years with above average sea ice concentrations and below average sea ice concentrations um, to show the difference. Uh, stippling is where p-values are uh, show 95% confidence of uh, the difference between the two samples. So let me explain what you're looking at here. This is a lot. Um, originally, these two, these two figures on either side were uh, together into one, but I kind of had to chop it in half to fill in the slide. Um, but on the left side, uh, you see low August CS concentration years. On the right side, uh, high August CS concentration years. The same on the right side of the figure. Uh, moving through, there are six different uh, three-month periods, January through March, February through April, March through May, April through June, May through July, and June through August. And I just composited these years see what the difference was uh, in terms of net two meter temperature anomaly. 
So blue would signal a temperature deficit, red would signature a temperature surplus. And early on, you don't necessarily see a lot of significant area. It's a little bit hard to see this stiff link on the projector, so I'll, probably, uh, uh, I'll try and point it out for you. Um, but you don't see too much significant area start to show up until March through May, so that's springtime. Uh, and over the Beaufort Sea, you start to see a pocket of higher magnitude uh, um, anomalies on both sides. Um, and then as you move forward in time, uh, those magnitudes start to strengthen and start to increase. Um, much warmer, uh, pretty much opposite. Uh, you have warmer uh, conditions in the open years or the low August CS concentration years, and uh, lower temperatures in the high August CS concentration years. And it seems to start over land uh, as far as significant area and then expand into the Northwest Passage until you reach this last time frame in June through August when it's a pretty much uh, significant region over the entirety of the Canadian archipelago and really warm in the low years, low, low CS years, and uh, really cold in the uh, high CS years. Now I'm looking at the net anomaly of a 10 meter zonal wind. So blue would signify westward winds, red would signify eastward uh, affecting winds. Um, I tried to uh, I put on uh, arrows to show the actual direction that the, the net effect of the winds would have uh, because the projection I'm using is slightly uh, skewed so the arrows aren't exactly left or right. Uh, but early in the season, there's not a distinct pattern that shows up. Uh, you start to see some significant areas show up in March through May uh, in the south west area of the Canadian archipelago, uh, just north of the Canadian continent. And it's uh, eastward, uh, net eastward effect winds versus uh, net, uh, net westward effecting winds versus net eastward effecting winds in the high sea ice years. And then this area kind of just explodes once you get to, <laughs> once you start including all the spring and early summer. Um, you see a large difference uh, in magnitudes and uh, this significant area starts to kind of propagate eastward until it lies right above north, uh, the Cayman uh, Archipelago and Northwest Passage region in May through July, and uh, slightly, it goes slightly eastward, uh, more eastward and south uh, with time in June through August. There seems to be an effect, the uh, difference of the zonal winds in these two cases. Um, the zonal wind in the, in the low sea ice would actually push sea ice out of Northwest Passage, as I showed you in 2013 versus 2016 and uh, into the Northwest Passage in these uh, high August sea ice years. Now, I'm not going to spend too much time on the meridional wind because it doesn't have that much of an effect. Uh, so there's not a true pattern that shows up until, uh, you could argue, even June through August, you start to see more significant area over the Beaufort Sea. Uh, but in this case, red would indicate northward uh, impacting winds, and blue would indicate southward uh, effect of the winds. Um, and again, you don't see too much start to show up, so it kind of suggests that the zonal wind is the main contributor to the dynamic difference between the years, uh, the dynamic ribbon difference between the years um, of high and low August sea ice. This is a composite of June, July uh, full wind averages for low and high August sea ice years, the left for low ice years, right is the high August sea ice years. Um, and actually, you see interesting patterns start to emerge. Um, Anticyclonic winds uh, in the low years and a slight cyclonic effect in the high sea ice years. And this uh, would, in the low years, this anticyclonic effect would actually push, uh, as I've said multiple times, uh, transport sea ice out of the Northwest Passage, kind of um, transporting it out, lowering sea ice concentrations, and the opposite is true for these high sea ice years. Um, right, and this figure shows a net anomaly of sea ice concentrations. So blue would indicate a sea ice concentration deficit, red a sea ice concentration surplus. And again, early in the season, the sea ice it is really locked up. Um, you have cold temperatures, it's not moving much, it's not changing too much. But then once you start to include the spring months, you do start to see a deficit in the low sea ice years and a uh, surplus in the high sea ice years already. And the significant area starts to expand with time until it's pretty much covering the entirety of the Beaufort Sea and the inside of the passage and once you are strongly in summer, uh, summer months. And the magnitudes kind of just uh, explode uh, in difference. But that seems to show up already in the spring. Uh, but compositing that sea ice thickness anomaly, where blue would signify a thickness deficit and red a thickness surplus, you actually start to see a difference in the southwest side of the northwest pass uh, of the Canadian Archipelago as soon as early as winter. So this area kind of stays stagnant, um, a little bit of uh, a difference in the significant area in um, February through April and March through May. But then onward from there, you start to see this, uh, the magnitudes of these uh, deficits and surplus really start to uh, grow, and then the significant area grows as well until um, you have an obvious difference in the CS thickness uh, between those two uh, samples. 
this I found interesting. I don't do uh, much more with the mean sea level pressure, but I wanted to point out uh, that the blue is the mean sea level pressure deficit, red mean sea level pressure uh, surplus. And early in the season, there's not much of a pattern. Um, maybe in March through May, you start to see a little bit of the southwestern uh, side of uh, where you have the Canadian uh, continent actually begins. But then you have this really high uh, pressures that show up in April through May in the low years, and uh, low pressures that show up in, in the April through June of the high years. And then this pattern just kind of even strengthens further, um, and it actually propagates eastward until in the summer months, it kind of sits over Greenland. And this would be driving that wind pattern that we saw, uh, where you have uh, high pressures, anticyclonic, low pressures, and more of a cyclonic winds. So composite analysis findings, just summing up um, all the information I just showed you. Spring is where we have pl positive and negative August CS concentration anomalies, and that's where they really seem to take shape between the two samples. Um, early season patterns become more pronounced and significant between the two samples with time. The zonal wind composites showed more significance than meridional, with anticyclonic pattern emerging. In the summer. Uh, sea ice concentration thickness and anomalies show up slightly earlier in the small area to the southwest of the Northwest Passage, which might be a good indicator of the type of year you're going to see. Here's going to part two, the correlation analysis. So we see a difference in the thermodynamic and dynamic environmental conditions. Um, I use accumulated anomalies again, but this time I'm calculating the piercing correlation coefficient and the p-values for each pixel between the accumulated anomaly uh, for each variable and the August sea ice concentration anomalies. So what am I doing here uh, for 1982 through 2020? Uh, so what am I, my main goal here is I'm trying to find which environmental variables are the strongest predictors of August CS concentration and when they become uh, significant. Is that, sorry, is that, uh, you have like a one-time index of uh, August CS anomalies over the whole region? Yes, well, it's the same August CS concentration anomalies for each variable uh, from 1982 through 2020. Okay, it's not like point by point correlation, it's not like it was warm here and uh, March when there's less sea ice in August at this location. It's it's per pixel. Uh, so, the, so the correlations are between conditions at that pixel in March and sea ice at that pixel in August. Yes. Got it. It's good to clarify. Uh, thank you for that. Actually, um, so this is the accumulated uh, accumulated or the net anomaly of uh, two meter temperature versus the mean August sea ice concentration anomalies. You can see uh, temperature seems to have an effect, a significant effect, early on in the season. Already uh, uh, in January through March, um, you see a lot of significant area within the Northwest Passage and over the Beaufort Sea in the West. Um, and this area just tends to, it just grows with time. And the correlations, they get slightly, uh, or the anti-correlations, sorry, because as temperature increases, the ice would decrease. Um, this area just starts, the correlation, anti-correlations start to strengthen with time until you get January through August. And there's uh, very close to uh, 1.0, uh, negative 1.0, uh, and the correlations across the board. Uh, this is the zonal wind uh, versus the zonal cumulative anomaly of the zonal wind versus mean August ice concentrations. Um, and early in the season, you don't see the same pattern uh, show up except for in the southwestern area off the Canadian archipelago. Uh, and the main reason for that is because, the, again, uh, I think I mentioned it already, but the sea ice is really locked up in the early season. It's not moving much. Sea ice concentrations are close to 100%, so they're not shifting. But then once you get into the spring, you're going to have warming up. The sea ice is going to start to thin. It's going to start to move around. And you have a positive correlation between the, uh, the zonal wind and where the sea ice, con uh, sea ice concentration is changing. And this really starts to show up in the spring uh, in the southwestern side. And this area starts to grow along pretty much the axis of the Canadian archipelago, uh, pushing sea ice concentrations uh, even further east uh, and raising them uh, with with uh, time. Uh, it goes from the Canadian archipelago in the central area. So more or stronger eastward wind would raise sea ice concentrations uh, in the Northwest Passage uh, even more with time. This is the meridional wind. Uh, again, uh, the meridional wind doesn't show a distinct pattern. Uh, it really doesn't show much uh, significant area until you start to get to May through July and June through August. Uh, where you see a little bit in the southwestern side of the Canadian Archipelago, um, which would indicate that there's some effect there. Um, my guess is it has something to do with land mass that's right here, um, but uh, there's no real pattern. And again, the zonal wind would probably be a better uh, predictor than the Viridiana wind of where sea ice concentrations are going to change. Uh, this is the cumulative anomaly of sea ice concentration uh, correlated with mean August sea ice concentrations. 
And again, early in the season, TS concentration is close to 100%, not changing. Um, but then when you, as you move into the spring, uh, obviously this different CIS concentration anomalies are going to have an impact on later anomalies. Um, and this area really starts to show that in uh, the spring when the CIS is moving around. Uh, May through July, you have a really strong pattern until June through August, when it's pretty much all 1.0, which would make sense because you're, uh, it's pretty much concurrent uh, with the CIS concentration anomalies. And this is, I said the best for last, the uh, sea ice thickness anomaly uh, with the mean obvious sea ice concentration anomalies. And pretty early in the season, uh, the whole Northwest Passage area is already significant. The correlations are already uh, 0.5 plus. And then this area just tends to uh, grow with time uh, as you move through the spring and into the summer months. Uh, pretty much the whole thing is significant. Uh, by the time you reach uh, April through June, uh, and then correlations just start to strengthen. So obviously, higher thickness is where you'd have higher CS concentrations. So just summing up the correlation analysis findings, so more variables become better with time. Ice thickness and temperature seem to have earliest connections to August CS concentration anomalies. And the zonal wind is a better predictor than the meridional wind. Uh, this is probably the biggest point, though, is although certain variables may be good predictors of August CS concentration earlier in the season, the composite analysis in part one tells us that the strongly positive or negative August CS concentration of years do not begin to differentiate themselves until the spring in most cases within the Northwest Passage, um, except for sea ice thickness and sea ice concentration off that southwestern side of the Canadian Archipelago. Which brings me to part three, which is the August CS concentration anomaly prediction. Um, so what is a convolutional neural network? Why do I use a um, I provide, it's really good at pattern recognition for short and long-term trends. Um, it's great at working with spatial data. Um, it's commonly used in, in, to analyze imagery, but it works well for geospatial data as well. And how, do I, how does my model work? So I give it five predictors. Uh, the 10 meter UND winds, two meter temperature, past CS concentration anomalies, and the ice thickness accumulative anomalies that I've been using. Um, so I give it those five predictors for uh, 30 years, and I give it one target variable each for those 30 years, which is the average August slate ice concentration anomaly again. Um, so what it's going to do, the, the model is going to start to learn patterns, the connections between those predictors and that target variable, and it's going to start learning. Uh, the, more I the longer I train it for, uh, the more time it's going to have to learn those patterns. Um, I, I also, obviously, uh, for those of you who are familiar with machine learning, you don't want to overtrain a model, um, which I had some issues with. Um, but essentially what it's doing is it's figuring out these connections and it's able to output a prediction. So my model uh, has those five predictors, it targets the average August CS concentration anomalies, and the training is those May, June, July accumulated anomalies. So this is uh, the predictions on the left and validation on the right for August 1992. And one thing up top uh, that you can notice, they're not the same image. Uh, so there is not, you know, it's not a perfect model. Uh, no models are. but. One thing I do want to uh, mention is that August 1992 was a, one of those anomaly years. It was actually a above average CS concentration year, and it doesn't get the magnitude correct, but what it does do, it actually gets some of the spatial distribution right of where the anomalies are going to be, particularly in the southern Beaufort Sea. You see this kind of a curved area of higher CS concentrations, which is also present in the validation. It's difficult to see, but in the central area of the Canadian Archipelago, it's actually predicting slightly higher CS concentrations. Uh, like we see in central uh, in validation. And then just south of Greenland, there's a spot of higher concentrations into the east, which it's also predicting uh, relatively well. Um, but that's just for August 1992. Uh, this is August 2007, which was a strongly uh, negative CS concentration year, where again, it doesn't get the magnitudes correct, but there is a relative overall um, negative trend or a, a negative anomaly of CS concentrations that's being predicted. It doesn't show up well on the, on the projector, but um, along this left side, it's predicting lower CS concentrations compared to validation, which also is. Um, it actually predicts slightly above average right here. It's, you can't really see that at all. But uh, throughout the passage, it seems to be doing OK. Um, not the best in terms of magnitudes. But this is probably my favorite image. It's a strongly negative CS concentration year again in two, August 2016. Uh, but the model actually predicts, if you see in the validation, we kind of have these three pools of low CS concentration areas. And it comes up very faintly on the convolutional neural network prediction, but you've got the same 
three um, uh, lower uh, predictions of uh, negative CS concentration anomalies. And throughout the passage, it, it does uh, predict these lower CS concentrations. And this upside down V area, where there's higher CS concentrations, um, is also present in validation. Uh, one more of those figures to show you, uh, the CS concentration anomaly for August of 2020. And this, again, it doesn't do as, it's probably the worst year uh, of, the, of the anomalous years I'm going to show you. Um, but it does give this pattern of low CS concentrations uh, in the Beaufort Sea, which are above this kind of entrance, this, uh, this inserting area of uh, higher CS concentrations. It kind of, it does get that symbol a little bit right there. But these, all these years I've shown you are anomaly years. Uh, they are the there are the extremes in the data set. Not extremes, but at least one standard deviation different. How does it do over the whole entire thing? So I correlated, I made predictions for all 39 years in my data set, and I correlated those to the validation. And we see it actually does pretty well. The, the stippling in this case represents uh, the 99% confidence interval. 95% uh, uh, pretty much contained all of the entirety of the Northwest Passage, uh, but it looked very similar to the 99%, so uh, to show that. Um, the correlations are, pretty high, uh, ranging from about, a, they can get close to one um, in parts of the Northwest Passage. Um, overall, where the p-values are 99% confidence, the uh, correlation average is about 0.6. So, but it does really well within the Northwest Passage and in the Beaufort Sea, which is something really great. Uh, I'm happy with it. Um, this is a really basic machine learning model. This is uh, my first uh, crack at it, actually. And this is something I can work with. I can add complexity to the model, and then it's going to be able to come up with uh, better projections the more complex I make a model um, and add more data. And I'll talk about how to improve it in a little bit here. So main conclusions. Um, overall, the best predictors of August CS concentration anomalies are the temperature, the CS thickness, and uh, the past or the earlier CS concentrations. The zonal winds become a very good predictor starting in spring, but morale winds are less reliable as a predictor. Um, however, the years with extreme positive or negative August CS concentration anomalies do not present significant differences from each other until spring, aside from in uh, terms of CS thickness and CS concentration. So using the predictors, I was able to make the convolutional neural network um, with reasonable accuracy of the spatial distribution. There's still some work to do on the magnitudes um, uh, using the May, June, and July data. Now, model performance decreases when I only train it on the net anomalies um, earlier in the year. For instance, I have models trained on only January, February, and March data. It is able to pick up large features, but it's not as good as the later data, which would make sense. But when I sum up all the data, so January through July, the um, model actually outperforms uh, just trained on May, June, through July, which I'll be happy to show um, at a later time. Um, but the magnitudes, again, are less than validation in this case. Uh, which I can work on. Um, but the model best predicts CS concentration anomalies within the Northwest Passage and over the Beaufort Sea, which is my target region, which I'm happy with. So future work, I want to add complexity to this model, as I mentioned. I think training on actual CS concentration values in, in, uh, instead of just net anomalies are going to be much better uh, for accuracy purposes. And uh, the long term, I want to be able to predict the long term and short term. So I want to predict like three days out for CS concentration, six days out, uh, maybe three month projections or six month projections. Um, I also want to add higher res resolution data as it becomes available. 12 and a half kilometer uh, spatial uh, resolution is decent, but obviously I would like something much better than that. Um, I want to add more variables. I think moisture, short wave, long wave radiation, cloud cover, ocean currents, the Arctic oscillation, and ENSO are going to have really uh, large impacts on the climate trends and patterns that you see in the Arctic, which have in turn have effects on sea ice, which if I put those in the model, the model is just going to be able to learn those patterns uh, even better. Um, I also want to add probability of predictions coming true. So for instance, if it uh, predicts 60% of CS concentrations in one area, what's the probability that that's actually going to come true? And then I want to explore the use of synthetic aperture radar data, or SAR data, uh, which would further increase the accuracy of CS concentration. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have as many issues in melt uh, conditions, which I think would be important. Um, finally, I want to make a few acknowledgments. Uh, Jeff Key and Yingwei Liu for uh, really mentoring me and guiding me through my master's work, and uh, you know, kind of helping me change topics uh, six months in, which was really, uh, which was really uh, kind of a change, but. Uh, Work, ended up working out in my opinion. 
Uh, they also involved me in their NOAA short course, uh, which we talked about Northwest Passage, and we actually uh, tra uh, talked to, um, I guess, students varying in age from high school all the way to professional years um, about um, satellite and sensing <coughs> in Northwest Passage, which I thought was pretty fun. I also want to thank Anthony Wimmers, who kind of introduced me to the machine. He helped guide me into the right direction for machine learning. Uh, this is my first ever use of machine learning, and uh, Anthony was able to kind of point me to the right literature, to the right sources, kind of give me examples of how to use a convolutional neural network. Uh, so thank you, Anthony. I also want to thank Tristan Lecouillet, uh, who helped guide, who's also who's on my GAC, uh, but also kind of guided me in undergrad, as well as graduate school, um, towards, uh, <laughs> towards um, um, the right direction. He also introduced me to Jeff, which worked out nice. Um, I also want to thank Grant Petty, who's also on my GAC. Um, he, uh, I think he's the single, he's the professor that I've had the most, uh, for, he's taught me the most in my classes. Uh, not necessarily, uh, I've had him, I, uh, like he taught more courses to me than anybody else. <laughs> um, so I want to thank him, he's taught me a lot uh, as well. Um, I want to thank like, other professors uh, that I've had throughout the years. Um, they've really kind of, I, I've used a lot of, um, I picked up little things throughout the years that I've used in this analysis in terms of code, in terms of statistical analysis. Um, so thank you to all my professors I've had. Also Grant Gilcrease, who um, always has his door open and doesn't seem to mind when I go into his office and just kind of talk about coding issues or he'll console me when the Badgers lose. Um, but uh, also my other graduate student friends and cohorts uh, who have been there and a lot of whom are here today, so thank you for coming. Um, I also want to acknowledge that this work was supported by the NOAA JPSS program, and um, uh, thank you to the NOAA JPSS program for uh, funding uh, references, and that's it. Questions? Data is detrended uh, beforehand um, by month as well. Um, but yes, good question. Okay. Ruja? So, uh, great talk. Uh, I know that this forecasting is a seasonal dependence and you going back three months is very important, but have you seen any persisting information coming from last August as you're going forward in August? Does it matter if you keep that mm -hmm. as a memory or does it keep as a memory? So, my answer to that would be that there's probably a dependence there. Um, but it's kind of hard to test for in that a lot can happen between one August and the next August. Uh, specifically in winter, you could have, uh, it really depends on the climate patterns. That was something me, Jeff, and Yingwei actually discussed. And it could be something we look at in the future. And uh, so my answer to that is there probably is a dependence there. Uh, but it's going to be a little bit more complex to look at that. Um, we have to kind of filter out those winter effects and, uh, and temperature effects. But good question. Hamish? Yeah, thanks. Um, you talked a bit at the end about improving your satellite products to see situation. But what you really care about is presence and absence. And so I wonder mean, if you've sort of about training your model on presence and absence rather than concentration itself, and I wonder if it would do a much better job of saying there is no CS in this location or there is CS in this location. Yeah, that's, a, that's another good one. So like a binary, um, yeah. uh, binary output. Uh, and I did explore using that at first. Um, and I think that's something I'm going to be looking at. Because uh, if you look at CIS extent plots online, there is uh, they do do that with this. Either this is where the extent ends, this is where ocean is. So it's kind of like a zero or a one uh, type of thing. And I think doing it that way um, is going to be uh, something I will look into. I did I did think about doing it that way early on. Um, then we kind of transition to these net anomalies and outputting like actual predictions. Um, but I I would be curious to see like how the accuracy um, changes uh, moving forward with like a binary output. Yeah. Um, yeah. Or wait, I'll, uh, staff. I'll come back to it. I'm wondering what specifics in Anor are you using and why are you using it? So it's a full convolutional network, neural network. Um, the reason I'm using that is because it was really kind of, it, it's a really simplistic model. I, I'm not, well, again, this is my favorite first uh, kind of entrance into machine learning. I think there could be better um, models out there. Um, I, ha I did explore using a long short-term memory model. But I kind of settled on this because it was a simplistic approach. It really allowed me kind of to learn and play with the model and figure out, okay, if I change this, um, this is what's going to output versus using a, a different type of computational neural network. Um, does that answer your question? Oh, yes. 
I'm not so familiar with neural networks, um, so sorry if this is a very ignorant question, but is the relationship between the variables, are you able to want to look at like different types of relationships between uh, different interactions of the variables, or does everything, does the network assume particular types of either linear or non-linear relationships in those variables? Yeah, um, it, it'll, it'll assume linear and non-linear relationships. So when you have a model, um, there are these things called neurons. So it kind of splits up the data um, depending on how many layers you have it. So if you find linear trends, if you find non-linear trends, at least that's the way I had it set up, there are, it, it will figure out um, different dependencies. Um, it, it's kind of complex in how it actually works. I don't necessarily know everything about it either, uh, but I have learned that it does pick up, uh, it actually weights different predictors. Like I, I have those five predictors that I put in, and it might weight thickness more than temperature in some areas. It might weight temperature more than wind in some others, and it might just totally ignore the meridional wind if it doesn't find a connection between those patterns. And that's kind of like the linear and non it, it really alters uh, based on spatial dependence, I've found. Um, because I've tested it where I've only put thickness to output the ice concentration anomaly. And it can give reasonable accuracy, but then if you add other variables, it, it just starts to make it, uh, some areas of the plot might look the same, but uh, some other areas might look different. Um, if that makes sense, I'm not sure. Yeah. John? I've got a couple of questions, Kyle. It's really good. It's interesting work. Congrats on the fellowship. Thank you. Uh, have you thought about maybe measuring storminess some way above a certain latitude? Because, you know, I, I think sometimes some of the Synoptic dynamics gets hidden in a partition to Zola and Rudyard wind. It might not tell you the whole story. I noticed on the 2016 and 2013 differences that, that the, the um, maybe it was the July, June, July, August average winds, you have a giant gyre in one year and you have nothing really well organized in the other. And I, I wonder if that doesn't show up in a storminess metric better than it might in Zola and Rudyard wind. So that's something that's interesting to me. And then the other that was um, maybe just brought up, uh, maybe it's kind of escaped my mind. Uh, oh. Can you use that, that method that you were just talking about, where you try one variable at a time, to determine in certain regions what direction does the prediction go if you add the next variable? Can you keep track of that as you go as sort of an iterative way? Yeah, um, I'll speak on that one first. Okay. Because I, uh, but uh, I could keep track of that. That was actually something we uh, looked, looked at um, in our weekly meetings. I kind of work with the model in one way, and if I add another variable, it would send the model in a different direction. And I think that's something I, I could keep, uh, I could go back and actually keep tabs on, like mm. look at accuracy with one variable versus another and see how it changes. I'm not exactly sure how I would do that, but I think that's a good point, uh, or that's a, that would be a really interesting project uh, or step to move forward with. Um, on your first point, yeah. uh, the storminess, I, I think that's a, a really good idea, um, because there is literature out there that the Beaufort Dryer is becoming more cyclonic um, it, with uh, climate change and uh, how it is, the dynamics are changing in that area. Um, I think that would be something I would like to add in there. Um, actually, in Angela's class, uh, there was a, we had a project uh, where we related uh, our research to uh, cloud physics, and I did some interesting correlations with cloud cover, and I'm wondering if adding that in, uh, or cloud cover in as a variable, could help with uh, storminess, because generally, um, I don't know, unless you have different uh, thoughts on it. Well, that'd be one way to do it. The simpler-minded way for me would be to just track, um, you know, the aerial extent of um, gridded data set where your sea level pressure is below 1,000 millibars, or okay. below 992, or below 988. So you get different thresholds, yeah. and that will tell you something about how many storms and of what intensity they are. And you could you can easily make a metric out of such a simple-minded thing like that. And it might be interesting. And it's a limited region, so that might be to your advantage too. It's actually interesting you brought that up because. Uh, Part of my next research, what I was looking at, is I actually found a cyclone, uh, era five cyclone tracking algorithm online mm. that was going to possibly use um, and step forward by making the model more um, advanced and, and, uh, and kind of relating it to those cyclones. So I think that that's about probably where I'm going to go from here. Um, but yeah, that's a good suggestion. Yeah, it's really good work. Angel? Yeah, my question builds off because, because you're kind of compiling quite a long list of all the potential things that could yeah. affect it on different time scales, right? Mm -hmm. So in how you prioritize that, you know, with maybe the idea that you're looking at the individual effects rather than throwing it all in there, mm -hmm. I'm just generally curious, what would you prioritize in terms of which of those variables and at what time scale do you think is going to have the most initial improvement based on what you've seen? Yeah, um, I think for long time scales, I wouldn't use wins. 
Um, for instance, if I'm trying to predict uh, six months out, I think there's too much that can happen in terms of, uh, you know, uh, at least the 10 meter winds. Uh, I would use thickness, ice thickness I think is a big one. Uh, I think temperature has a good impact as well because, um, you know, there's, there's some memory in the water with temperature. If it's really warm, the, the uh, heat content will stay there. Um, but I think uh, adding, uh, uh, what was the second part of your question? Yeah, just of the list of things you would like to consider adding, mm -hmm. where do you start? What do you think might have the most impact? Oh, okay. Does it depend yeah. on the time scale? I imagine, well, I was just kind of curious, like just logistically, how are you going to kind yeah. of tackle that list and what do you think is going to make an initial big impact? Let me go back to where I list those. Um, I think moisture would probably be where I'd start. Um, and the reason I would start there is because I think moisture has, it would really impact, um, because we're start, starting to see uh, more, um, especially in the melt seasons, you know, when the moisture starts to get into the Arctic, um, it can drive the melt even more than just high temperatures. And I think moisture, at least on a short time scale, would have good, uh, would, uh, would improve the results even further. Um, I think after that, I would do shortwave and longwave radiation because I think that could also, uh, or cloud radiation effects as well, because I think that would help as well uh, uh, on short time scales. Uh, but for long time scales, I think uh, 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 possibly the Arctic Oscillation and ENZO would be interesting to add in there, uh, in fact, on the longer time scale. Um, yeah. If you look at moisture, like column moisture, yeah. total column moisture. Yes. Yeah. I have one last question. Uh -huh. Pretending to be your future employer, mm -hmm. I think they're going to be very interested in the thickness. As I'm just wondering if you've thought about predicting the thickness instead of the concentration. And yes, I have thought about doing that. Um, I think part of the reason we didn't decide to do that is because uh, the we use the APPX data. But that's that's not necessarily the best data to um, to use. I think just looking at predicting thicknesses. Um, I think a lot of the, correct me if I'm wrong, but a lot of the more recent thickness project, uh, projects like uh, ISAT or IOSAT uh, that have uh, laser altimeters uh, for thickness, I don't know if they work very well in melt conditions or if they have the data sets available in the summer. Um, but I think going forward, um, I think predicting thicknesses would be a direction to go, especially kind of pairing it with the sea ice concentration. Like you're going to have a high concentration of meter thick ice in this area. I think that would be a way to make modeling more advanced as well and uh, you know, improve uh, forecasting for vessels because they probably want to know more about thickness uh, than the CS concentration in, in, uh, in some respects. Um, Hannah? Yeah, I have two questions. So the first is um, in your sort of spatial correlation stimulus that you plot the thickness of the ice and the thickness of the ice. Mm -hmm. So if you have the thickness, what did you say? Sorry. If you take into account field significance for your spatial like, stimulus correlation, don't so like I'll off 575, I don't know if you took a little bit of a but just bear it. Yeah, I don't think I did, but I would like to talk to you more about that, uh, kind of incorporating that, actually. Um, and then the second one is kind of along the line of what Angela has been asking, and I'm just curious what your rationale was for leaving out surface motion variable in your original analysis, particularly your CNN. Yeah, I think the main reason was because I couldn't find a good enough data set on my own. <laughs> I would have loved to put uh, ocean currents in there, specifically because the, the Beaufort gyre is right there. That would have a really uh, good, uh, you know, would show the general direction of where sea ice is going. Um, but again, that would be something I would love to talk to you more about too. Is uh, you know, adding, uh, see what you would use uh, for adding in ocean currents. Uh, Jack. Yeah, I guess I kind of have a question also about that, but it'll kind of be about both the past and the future. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned that you had, or you ran into issues of like model overfitting. Mm -hmm. um, was that when you were still just using five features? I guess that's the kind of first half of the question. Yeah, so it was, it was when I was using five features, but I was, uh, if you're not familiar with machine learning, uh, it runs through the data as, as many times as you tell it to train. And uh, that I ran into overfitting issues when I would run it for 500 plus epochs, so it would go through the data 500 times. But when I would, so I had to kind of find that happy place where I would uh, get the right amount of epochs so it would train with correct accuracy, but wouldn't overfit the model and not be able to adjust to extremes, uh, if that makes sense. Yeah, and my second, my second part is that like, so it seems like, yeah, you kind of like developed a good, at least sort of intuition to be like, okay, like I know how much to tune this thing. Um, you're going to have to be like kind of pushed on that again when you add in more features. 
do you have like a plan in place or at least like have you kind of prepped for that to be like okay like I also now I'm introducing like overfitting like possibility with all these additional features. Yeah, no, that's a good plan. Uh, that's a good uh, that's a good observation. I think that's something I'm going to have to work through. I think uh, what what uh, what John was talking about earlier is kind of keeping track about the tweaks I do to the model and what how the output changes is going to be really uh, big on that because I can I can run the model. Um, let's say I introduce moisture. Uh, I'll see how it performs on that, but then uh, I'll ch keep all the other uh, hypervariables the same in the model, but then um, before I'll run it on just those five variables and see how the moisture changes it, and maybe uh, go through um, you know any new variables and really kind of figure out, okay, if, uh, if I introduce this model, I have to reduce this number of epochs when I change it, I have to add uh, this many, um, uh, to, or add more. Uh, you know that's a good observation. It's going to be it's going to be hard to find the right balance, especially when introducing all these variables. But there, are, I believe it, it is done because there are models that predict uh, CIS extent and CIS thickness out there, and they uh, they actually just throw every variable they can at it and the, let the model figure it out. But what I'm trying to do, uh, as you, as uh, many of you may have uh, figured out at this point, is kind of use the right variables instead of just throwing everything. I can at the model and hoping it figures it out. So I kind of want to be more precise. So I think that's going to be a big part of it. Steph? I just wanted to add a little bit of a note of caution um, with the whole add other variables, take other variables out. Um, it gets to be really complicated on what is improving and why it's improving. And um, you can't just kind of like remove something from the model and then not retrain. No, I, I'm really happy you brought that up. I definitely will do that. Um, I, I have been retraining whenever I put in other variables, uh, but the hyperparameters, I would definitely have to talk more about that. Um, yeah, so thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. Um, do, you, well, I, it's a two <laughs> do you have a sense of whatever resulting ICD in August in the NWP, is it locally generated or is it being infected into the NWP? It's a, it's a, Good. That's a good question. Um, I, I think it would be it would be affected in because it's summertime. So I think temperatures are you know they're usually above zero, maybe right around zero. But it'd be hard to generate more first year ice in the summer in the current state of the Arctic. So I'm expecting that a lot of that is affected in by the winds. Um, yeah. So then with that knowledge, would it not be more conducive for your model to incorporate the entirety of the Arctic Circle? Yeah, that's a, another good question. That's a, well, uh, we actually, I did originally train it on the entire Arctic Circle, um, but then actually, uh, but then um, there was kind of an issue, or we thought about training it just on the Northwest Passage region for kind of to tell the model this is where we want to go, and kind of uh, you know dedicating the model's resources to just the Northwest Passage. But I think taking the entire Arctic would actually improve that as far as ice infection would go. Um, that's a good point. Did you have a question? No, just, I mean, in the first part of the, of the talk, the, you know, especially the correlation analysis, everything's very local. Mm -hmm. uh, and the convolutional neural network, I guess I'm more familiar with how you use non-local features for predicting. Is that incorporated into the, your particular use of the convolutional neural network? And how do you, uh, how do you turn like the, um, I mean, this would, this would play into a role, this would, this would play into like the role of the action or into the, I guess when I think about prediction, the large scale features are probably more predictable than the fine scale, like what's happening at an individual location. And so, you know, that might play into some of that as well. Yeah, uh, the model does take into account uh, non local, uh, non local infection, uh, at least from my understanding. Um, like you use, the, you use the entire, like, like a, an image or something uh, as, a, as a predictor for local points or what, how does that work with the convolutional model? So um, 
it uses, so I put in, it's, it's kind of hard to think about this. Um, so I put in these images, and then it swims so the full map. It does full map, yes. I believe that's what it does. Um, it, I put in these images, and then it will kind of figure out from these images, so I mean, it's not uh, where uh, these anomalies are occurring, and don't know how well it does on um, you know, a small scale. It can find the big features, but the small features I think I still need to work on. Uh, if that makes sense, maybe I didn't answer your question. Uh, so at any given point, it's, yeah. oh, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think yeah, it's enough of an answer. I, mean, I, 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 I think I just wonder. I was curious about that too. Yeah, like whether know. whether the whole like at any given point is it the whole map that's predicting what's happening at that? Oh point? yes. 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 Yeah. So there are yeah. non-local influencers. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> we got it now. <laughs> That's John. Well, let's end on a uh, that was a good question. Yeah. But uh, let's end on an easier one. Let's say I work for a cruise ship company, mm -hmm. and I'm in charge of planning the next cruise. So I call you up because I've heard about your talk, <laughs> and I ask you how much in advance of August, can you predict the opening or closing of the passage, and what do you need to know to do that? Now, a lot of that was in your summary, but to call you up and I ask you that question, what are you going to know? So right now, I would say I would need to wait for spring. I would need spring data, because uh, if, if we go to the main conclusions, um, you know, th those really positive, uh, those two samples of years I was talking about, really positive concentration years and the really negative concentration years, don't present themselves until spring. And based on the data I have made on the model, uh, or the training I have done on other models, I think I would need spring data to be confident that I would have enough, uh, be able to predict enough of these anomalies to tell you this area of the, or the Northwest Passage is going to be open this year, um, you should be good to go versus uh, don't go there. So spring, I think, would be the, the cutoff there. Okay, not good enough. I need, I need to enough. know the year. <laughs> Why stop there? Five years. Ago. <laughs> All right, and I'll fifty years in advance. You should be just fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. Now. All right. Okay. Thanks, Kyle. Thank you.